from the studios of Postscript Media and Canary Media. You probably heard a lot about, or maybe even experienced, the mega drought hitting the western U.S. Western states are experiencing the worst mega drought in at least 1,200 years. Yeah, they say climate change has made the issue 72% worse. The Colorado River Basin, a lifeline of the American Southwest, is shrinking. And with it, the country's two largest reservoirs are going dry. This is playing out in very visible ways. Water levels at Lake Mead, east of Las Vegas, have dropped almost 160 feet in the past two decades. One state over, Lake Powell's water levels have dropped 100 feet in the last three years. And now shortages on the Colorado River mean that Arizona, Nevada, and New Mexico are facing cuts to their own water use. But those are not the only water reserves under threat. Hundreds of feet underground, the drought is impacting our water security in ways we can't even see. The Ogallala Aquifer is gigantic. It's like, I don't know, 175,000 miles, <laughs> square miles. The Ogallala Aquifer. It's the largest aquifer in America and one of the largest in the world. It's a, um, you know, underground water source for eight states. Um, and we're relying on this water to grow our food. The Ogallala Aquifer stretches from South Dakota in the north to Texas in the south. If you look at it on a map, it looks a bit like a tornado. The widest part of the funnel covers Nebraska. The skinny part stretches down through Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. It provides drinking water for almost 2 million people, and it supports about $35 billion in agriculture every year. It lies beneath about a third of the country's irrigated lands. But even hundreds of feet below ground, the Ogallala Aquifer can't escape climate change. You know, people have been talking about how it's getting depleted, it's getting overused, getting poured onto our crops, and there's no, you know, bringing it back. Once it's depleted, it's, it's you know, going to take like 6,000 years for it to, to regenerate itself. That's Melody Edwards. She's a host and producer at Wyoming Public Media, and she's been reporting on water issues across the West for a long time. One of the oldest you know, things that we hear in the in the West is, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. Water is for fighting. As the drought puts pressure on water resources and groundwater reserves drop lower and lower, that fighting, it's going to get ugly. This is The Carbon Copy. I'm Stephen Lacey. This week, we're taking you to the front lines of the Western Water Wars. In Laramie County, Wyoming, we'll explore a conflict that tells us a lot about how water battles could unfold across the West. And we'll talk through some of the legal changes that might help protect the Ogallala Aquifer. America's green banks are preparing to unleash a wave of capital for clean energy. The Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund invests a historic $27 billion in projects nationwide. This could mobilize up to $150 billion of private capital for solar, storage, efficiency, and electrification in underserved communities. So how do we deploy those billions quickly, efficiently, and with the highest impact? On July 18th, Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure will host a virtual event exploring the -the on-the-ground realities of making America's green banks a success. Register for free by clicking the link in the show notes or go to latitudemedia.com slash events. Clean energy and climate tech are policy-driven industries, and anyone working in this field touches local, state, and federal policy in a very real way. And that's why you should be listening to Political Climate, a podcast from Latitude Media and Boundary Stone Partners that delivers an insider's view on climate policy and politics. Every other week, co-hosts Julia Piper, Emily Dominich, and Brandon Hurlbuck cover the nuances of government funding, regulations, backroom negotiations, and the election, of course. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations and strong opinions from voices across the political spectrum. Listen at latitudemedia.com or subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts. Melody Edwards hosts a podcast called The Modern West. It's a show that tells stories about how the evolving environment in the West is reshaping the identity of the West. Almost every story that I do has some is related in some way to climate change. It's just permeates all the storytelling that you do. I spoke to Melody as she was in the middle of developing a new season on ranching. And ranchers, they're getting hit hard by this drought. Most of us don't think much about groundwater or how the drought is affecting it. The bathtub ring at Lake Mead, we get. The slow flow of the Colorado River, we see it. But groundwater, it's invisible. Melody asked USGS scientist Olivia Miller to describe it. 
it's sort of this like fundamental, like foundation of our water supply in that it's there when we have droughts, you know, and we don't, our surface water is stressed. It's, you know, it's there. And so we can turn to that. And as we increasingly, and for a longer time have um, kind of a stressed surface water system, people turn to groundwater more. So they use it more. It's sort of like your savings account where you, you put a little bit in at a time and then you kind of can draw on it when you need to. But if you just start to rely on that, it, it'll eventually run out. And in parts of the Ogallala, the water is already running out. There's parts of Kansas that are really have completely, you know, lost all their water. Parts of Oklahoma, parts of Texas that just don't have that water source anymore. And it's a concern, especially with climate change, because that water is going even faster now. So when did we start tapping into that water resource and and how did it change the region? Yeah, so, you know, we have been, I think it was named in like 1898, and we started using it, especially around World War II for our crops. Around that time, we were really trying on the global scale to, you know, manufacture food and become a real player in food manufacturing on a global scale. Before World War II, the region above the Ogallala was pretty bad for farming. You've probably seen those terrible pictures of the Dust Bowl in the 1930s. That was the result of farming and drought in the high plains in the early 20th century. But the rise of a special technique called center pivot irrigation, it changed everything. Arid plains were transformed into agricultural meccas, and it all relied on water sucked up from the Ogallala. When we invented that style of irrigation, that's when we really started relying on the Ogallala Aquifer to uh, to really water our crops across the country. And so we started really, you know, relying on this underground water, which felt at that time like it was bottomless amount of water, but we're seeing it, it disappear very rapidly. Decreasing water resources spell conflict across the West. But there's one group that Melody feels has a particular stake in struggles over water. A lot of ranchers are, you know, finding themselves in situations where they are kind of um, the last uh, place where species are protected, where um, like grasslands um, are untilled. Um, So a lot of conservation is kind of falling into the hands of ranchers. And that includes water and how we are managing that. The problem is, is that that ranching is, is not a very viable lifestyle, and a lot of people can't make a living at it. And so huge, vast amounts of land and the conservation of species and water and resources is falling in the hands of, as I said, an older and older demographic of rancher. What are the frontline impacts on ranchers of that mega drought? There's not enough grass growing out there, forage for their animals. They don't have as much water to irrigate their their hay crops. They are dealing with fires. It's affecting every aspect of their lives in every way that you can think. Melody spent a lot of time during her reporting with a Wyoming rancher named Alan Kirkbride. The Ogallala water levels haven't fallen as much in Wyoming as they have in other regions, but a report from the state engineer's office found that parts of the aquifer in Laramie could be depleted in 50 years. And Alan has been determined to protect that resource. Do you have a lot of cattle out here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do. How many do you have? We have about uh, 5,500. Wow. What do we have is an eight, eight member family business. We've been going in 100 years or more. Is that right? Really, since 130 years, actually. So, and that's just what we do full time. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and how many acres? Well, and I, I don't give out that information. Okay. It's big. <laughs> yeah, it's big. Big enough that you don't give out that information. That's right. <laughs> right. A couple years ago, Alan found himself at the center of a battle over water when his neighbors, the Lerwick family, applied for a permit to drill some high-capacity groundwater wells. Alan worried those wells would impact his own water rights. I heard about it from neighbors who had become aware of it and called. 
And uh, I, you know, and for a while I didn't kind of wake up and get with it. And I think I'm like the one neighbor. If it had been one well, I said, oh, well, I got more to do. I got fence to fix. But when it kind of soaked into me what was at risk and what was being proposed, why well, it just had to get act. And these water wells, each one of them would just be enormous amounts of water. And between the eight of them, they would supply a, a city of 10,000 people with all the water they needed to, you know, water their lawns and take baths and do everything they would need to do. So that's a lot of water. And all of the neighbors around them were very concerned about this. Alan is one of the the neighbors of the Lurwick family who started pushing back and joined forces with Reba Epler, the water attorney, to to try and fight the these water wells. And I went out to his place and visited him. Um, just a really nice gentleman in his, you know, late 60s. A lot of these ranchers that are fighting this are much older, and he is one of them. And, and he took me out to see the stream where it was percolating up as a spring. Um, just this beautiful ranch gorgeous white cliffs and you know if you looked out across to see this place from the interstate it would look like there's nothing out there but there's just gorgeous geology and giant cottonwood groves and cattail stands and birds like you wouldn't believe just a really beautiful area and you know as this stream trickles out it does lots and lots of meanders and is dammed up by beavers and is a very functioning um, stream system that is also as Alan told me you know storing carbon, sequestering carbon in the soil because it's a nice slow moving stream but a lot of the streams, it's its one of the last streams that's still flowing in this area. All of the rest of the streams have dried up from over-irrigation. And so presumably that stream would dry up with this high-capacity well or series of wells? Exactly. That is his. That is the concern is that, um, and, and all of these ranchers are afraid that this one last remaining stream, it's called Horse Creek, that... Um, if if these eight high capacity water wells are allowed to go through, that that Horse Creek would dry up as well. Now I've lived in rural areas, and my drinking water has come from wells. We're not talking about that kind of well. What is a high capacity well like? What how much water are we talking about? What does the operation look like? Yeah, so it would be enough water to cover forty seven hundred acres with a foot of water, um, which is one and a half billion gallons. So it's it's a really large amount of water, and that would be enough to supply a, a city of actually 13,000 people a year. So, yeah, it's, it's not your typical well for a, a house or something like that. One and a half billion gallons a year. Alan Kirkbride and the rest of the Lerwick neighbors, they were concerned that water was going to be used for more than just farming. So they embarked on a legal battle to fight the permits for the wells, one that ended up changing water law across the entire state of Wyoming. And that's coming right up after the break. On July 18th, join Latitude Media and Banyan Infrastructure as we take a deep dive into the next phase of deploying the $27 billion Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. We'll provide practical insights for the state agencies and local lenders at the front lines of dispensing these funds. Where are the bottlenecks? How do we balance speed with transparency? And can America's green banks live up to the expectations of both local communities and Wall Street? Latitude Media Stephen Lacey, Banyan co-founder Amanda Lee, and Clean Energy Fund of Texas EVP Billy Briscoe will answer these questions and more on July 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This is a must-attend for project developers and financiers. Register for free at latitudemedia.com slash events or click the link in the show notes. I'm Julia Piper. I'm Brandon Hurlbut. And I'm Emily Dominich. A little over a year ago, political climate took a break so we could focus on the groundwork of implementing America's biggest ever climate bill, the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm excited to say political climate is back. 
And I'll be joined by my two co-hosts to riff on the top political stories and insider scoops from state houses to the halls of Congress to regulatory agencies and even international climate talks. We'll explain how those developments are driving industry decisions today. Political Climate is a show for people who want authentic conversations. And to learn about how energy and climate policy is shaped within both political parties from the people who have actually helped shape it. So join me, Brandon, and Emily every other week, starting in April, for fresh episodes of Political Climate. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. How common is this conflict that we are seeing? How contentious has that fight become? This is Wyoming. People are polite. When I went and saw them in court, everybody was very uh, diplomatic and there was not a lot of, you know, it hasn't gotten too ugly. Let's put it that way. The area around Laramie actually has a history of water conservation. Since 1981, two-thirds of Laramie County has been designated a water control area. That's an area where special rules are put into place to conserve groundwater. The district conservationist had developed a program to get everybody in the neighborhood to agree to not do so much irrigation and to, um, to try and conserve this water and protect it. And they had a control board that was helping them manage this. They started saving, you know like a billion gallons of water in a year. Um, Just really a lot of water was conserved this way. But one day, things started to change. Well, then suddenly, uh, oil and gas started being interested in moving into this area, and the state engineer, randomly out of nowhere, decided it was okay to issue permits for high-capacity water wells in this area when they hadn't been allowed to for years because of this control area. Um, designation. And so suddenly the state engineer saw dollar signs is what probably happened. That's what the district conservationist told me. And so essentially the this Lerwick family says that what they want all this water for is for crops. But there's a possibility that they what they really want to do with it is sell the water later, that they're hoarding the water, getting, you know, access to it and then hoarding it so that they can sell it later for fracking or perhaps to a municipality like Cheyenne uh, for water. This phenomenon that Melody is talking about, it's called speculative water use. It basically means you say, hey, I think I need this much water per year, but instead of using that water for what you say you're going to, like watering your crops, you end up selling it to someone else. That's water speculation. And in Wyoming, it's technically not illegal. So they recognize that, you know, it's an era of climate change and that water is going to be very valuable and that they're going to try and get their hands on as much as they possibly can so that they can sell it later. How big of a problem is speculative uh, use across the Ogallala Aquifer? I know that the state of Colorado um, is actually working on some bills to try and fight this problem. Wyoming is the state where this actually was, this water law um, sort of approach was developed, which is that these are public waters. They belong to us all. And that we need to use this water so that it benefits us all. It's public. And so, you know, for some people to be kind of hoarding water and selling it for their own benefit, um, for their own purposes later on, that is kind of skirting around what is supposed to be a settled philosophy towards water, which is that it belongs to everyone. And so Colorado is currently considering some bills to um, to make speculation illegal. And uh, Reba Epler, the, um, the water attorney that I've been working with, is also interested in trying to see if she can um, get lawmakers to propose bills doing the same here. And how do we legally treat access to surface water and groundwater? They're treated differently, yes? Yeah, and that's a frustration to some people who want to reform water law across the West, where we're, like I said, people have this these misconceptions that underground water is separate from surface water, and w- when they're actually all part of one water cycle, um, and they're all part of our climate. And so there's a lot of folks who are kind of calling to really reshape our water laws so that it better reflects the that interconnection between underground water and surface water. So one solution could be to consolidate rights for surface and groundwater 
because of that hydrological connection? That could be, you know, and to just start to manage water in a way that is where you're considering like the the base flow, making sure that you have a minimum base flow. So again, base flow is the water that's flowing out from the underground aquifer, making sure that that always is flowing, you know, because a lot of times when you when you go in and hear these cases, these water cases in the courtroom, and all they're considering is how can farmers make lots of, grow lots of crops? Can this water benefit the public by creating jobs in the oil and gas? industry, and that's the only thing that they're considering. Whereas these ranchers are are wanting to do is to say, wait a second, there's a beneficial use in having the stream flowing on the top of the land and creating these beautiful wetlands where birds can come, where, you know, fishermen can use those areas, where hikers can have that as a destination, outdoor recreation benefits, and other kinds of uses besides just industry. And so it's going to take an overhaul, but I think that with climate change really starting to put the pressure on, that there's will now um, to really start to rethink our water law in this country. Alan Kirkbride is part of that movement to rethink Western water law. During his fight against the high-capacity wells, Alan was part of a group of ranchers that went to the Wyoming legislature to say, hey, the way we're permitting groundwater wells right now, it's got to change. They were successful in passing a bill to the applicant to prove that the, that these permits would not injure the neighbors um, and other water users. Before this new law, if your neighbor applied for a permit for a huge amount of water, say mm, a billion and a half gallons, you're the one who has to go to court to prove that permit might hurt your water rights. This law flips it on its head. Now the person asking for the water has to prove it won't hurt the water rights of their neighbors. It's a small change, but it's a start. I think that there is a will within Wyoming legislature to start to try and reform Wyoming water law so that it better reflects an era of drought. So what comes next in this story? And not just on a short-term political basis, but we're we're talking about a long-term trend that is going to really reshape the West um, when we think about you know, how water is going to be used and the impact of this mega drought. What do you think the next phase of the story will bring? Well, I think I'm a little worried. It looks like the state engineer is going to, you know, issue these permits and allow this kind of drilling, which means that that could happen again elsewhere in the state. And then other states look at what Wyoming's doing. We are a leader in water law, and and so we are kind of a model. And that could help us start becoming more common to be like, okay, well, let's let speculation happen because water is becoming so um, valuable. And that's a scary scenario going forward. But that does seem the trajectory that I'm seeing at the moment. What I hope is that there's going to be um, folks like Reba and like these ranchers who are going to come out of the woodwork and surprise a lot of these um, bureaucrats who are kind of making this kind of water speculation possible. And there's going to be more demand to, to reform things. Sadly, Alan Kirkbride passed away this March before he could see the bill that he advocated for signed into law. But he fought until he died to protect the landscapes that he loved. But isn't it great that we've got places like this on the the plains? You know, know, mountains have have green and riparian places, but on the plains it's less. They're rare places. They're special places. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Melody Edwards is the host and producer of Wyoming Public Media's podcast, The Modern West. Because I was a fiction writer originally, I just really was drawn to the storytelling of podcasting. And so, uh, yeah, ended up becoming the host and producer of The Modern West. You can find The Modern West anywhere you get your shows, and you can find The Carbon Copy on Canary Media or any podcast app of your choice. That is because The Carbon Copy is a co-production of Postscript Media and Canary Media. Go check out all of Canary Media's coverage at canarymedia.com. Sign up for the newsletter where you'll get the pod and you'll get all sorts of other good news on the energy transition. This episode was produced by Alexandria Herr. Ann Bailey is our senior editor. Sean Marquand is our engineer. 
Original music came from Sean Marquand, Echo Finch, and Blue Dot Sessions. The tape from Alan Kirkbride and Olivia Miller is courtesy of Melody Edwards. Thanks, Melody. Postscript Media is supported by Prelude Ventures, a venture capital firm that partners with entrepreneurs to address climate change across a range of sectors. That includes advanced energy, food and agriculture, transportation and logistics, advanced materials and manufacturing, and advanced computing. Give us a rating and review on Apple or Spotify. Send us your thoughts on social media. I'm Stephen Lacey. Thanks for being here. This is The Carbon Copy. Carbon Copy.